Good morning to one and all present here with us today. Before we begin, we would like to thank our sponsors for making Pragyan 24, title sponsored by Larson and Tuberon, powered by Cisco, driven by TVS Apache. We thank Bharatversity, our youth partner, Technosport, our associate partner, NLC, our energy partner, and Recal, our, our alumni association, Holly Davidson, our motorcycle partner, Titan I Plus, our principal infotainment partner, Zebronix, our audio partner, and Unibic, our snack partner. Nestle, Conmat, and Covens, our infotainment partners, Pepsi, our refreshment partner, PG Nido Sweets, our sweet partner, Himalaya, our personal care partner, and CSK, our merchandise partner, Media One, our Malayalam media partner, InShots, our digital media partner, Hubhopper, our podcast partner, Turian FM, our Tamil radio partner, LA Cinemas, our Trichy, Trichy Cinema partner. Welcome to the 1980 Batch Chair Fund Nobel Laureate Guest Lecture. We are all grateful to have you all join us here today for a very intellectual session that is sure to have a profound impact on you. Before we commence, our heartfelt appreciation goes to our esteemed deans, director, ma'am, and faculty members, and all the students present here for gracing us with their presence. I am Akansh, and this is Niranjan, and we will be your hosts for the day. A Nobel Prize winner in the field of medicine in 1993, a revered figure in biochemistry known for his groundbreaking work in gene splicing and the discovery of introns in eukaryotic DNA. With a relentless pursuit for knowledge and discovery, he has reshaped our understanding of genetic purposes, processes, leaving an indelible mark on molecular biology. His Nobel Prize journey from a young and budding scientist to one of the most revered scientific minds is truly commendable to say the very least. We are honored to have Dr. Richard Roberts here with us. Great to have, us, great to have you with us, sir. We would now like to request Director Ma'am, all the deans and the alumni to come to the stage to present the memento. We would request Director Ma'am to present the Institute Memento. We would now request all the deans to present the Pragyan Memento. Thank you. Now, sir. Over to you to begin the guest lecture.
Okay, I'm going to come and walk forward a little bit so that I can see the slides just like you. Then I, at least in principle, will know what I'm talking about. So what I want to do today is to take you on a, a, a memoir, biographical tour of my life, how I got to be a Nobel laureate. And I'm going to start right at the very beginning, but I just want you to notice one thing. You'll see on this slide um, a butterfly battering on the Biolab sign. That's because the person who started New England Biolabs lo loved butterflies, loved nature. And so the whole company was dedicated to nature one way or another. You'll also see a little girl cartoon holding a bacterium. And that's because I love bacteria. I always find humans are rather too complicated for me. So even though I made my discovery in, in a human virus, um, my principal work has always been on bacteria. Does this thing actually work? Huh? Which one? Okay, which one? Second one? Yeah, that's... Oh, okay. Let's see. Okay, fine. So I'm going to start off where I was born. I was born in Derby in England, which is right in the middle of the screen on the left-hand side. Pardon? I'm not sure what you're saying here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, no problem. We just some slight technical difficulties here, but you know, for a technological institute, that's not a good thing. Oh, so just remember that in the future. And the other thing, one thing I should tell you is that it is really important in a lecture hall to have a clock. So I'm going to start on my cell phone so I can keep track of the time and at least know what's going on. But you should have a clock at the back of the room so the speaker can keep on time. So I was saying I was born in Derby in England. It's a city in the middle of the country, and I was born during the Second World War. <clears throat> and Derby is very close to a Rolls-Royce factory where they were making the engines for the Air Force who were busy going over and bombing Germany and fighting against Germany. And the Germans were constantly trying to bomb this factory. And it turned out that the street that I lived on was right on the flight path between Germany and the Rolls-Royce factory, and they used to come over trying to bomb it. And in those days, the accuracy of the bombing was not very high. And so the street I lived on, one side of that street suffered quite severe bomb damage, but not the side that I lived on. And so... If I'd lived on the other side of the street, I wouldn't be here to talk about it today. And so this was the very first example of something I'm going to talk about throughout this talk, that is luck. You know, it was pure luck that I was on one side of the street and not the side that got bombed. And it wasn't until I started thinking seriously about how luck had affected my life that I thought about this. You will see later on, I will tell you quite a lot about luck and how important it is uh, and what you should do about it when you get it. Now, my parents were not well educated. They both had left school at 14. They um, had rather menial jobs. My father was a motor mechanic. Uh, my mother worked in a store until she had me, and then she stopped, and um, I became um, her sole interest. When I was four, we moved down to Bath. Bath is a beautiful city. If ever you go to England, um, don't just stick with London. It's well worth spending a day to go and visit Bath. It's founded on a, an old settlement that was formed because of hot springs. There are natural hot springs there, so there's hot water coming up. When the Romans came and took over England, they developed it into a, a very nice city, and they set up these things. We call them the Roman baths, 
But they're beautiful architecture baths all around the hot spring. So a lot of nice stuff there. So my father um, worked for the local city council. That meant that it was good in one sense. We had a nice flat that um, was, you know, was a council flat, so it was fairly cheap. And it was really very, very nice to be there. Now, I went to a junior school when I was about seven. And this school, very small, very parochial kind of school. But for me, it worked out quite well. And it worked out well because it turned out that the headmaster at this school took an interest in me. Um, I had no idea why at the time. But I, after I'd been there a couple of years, he used to give me puzzles to do. He would give me a piece of paper, and it would have a little mathematical puzzle on it. And he would say, you know, go home, see if you can solve this puzzle, and then bring the answer to me. So I would do that. And say I'd take the answer back if I could solve it. And this really got me interested in mathematics. And if you'd asked me till I was about eight, nine, I was definitely going to be a mathematician. I just love mathematics, and I still do. Um, but not professionally as much as I had in mind originally. A little later, I read a book called How I Became a Detective. This was how one becomes a typical you know, detective in the police force, and that sounded fabulous. I, I thought this was going to be my career. I would love because I like puzzles, I like games, I like solving things. And so I was going to be a detective. And then my father bought me a chemistry set when I was 11. And it was the days when chemistry sets were actually interesting. They had all sorts of good chemicals, interesting chemicals in them. And while you could do many of the simple things, changing color and mixing things that you would do in a chemistry set today, I discovered it was also possible to make fireworks, to make explosives with the chemicals in this kit. And I fell in love with chemistry. And that was the point at which I really said, I am going to be a chemist. And so you see, already I've changed my mind three times about what I'm going to do with my life. And that has been fairly constant throughout my life. And I would recommend to all of you you should read around your subject, go to lectures about things that are not directly connected with your subject, because you just never know when you will hear about something, you'll say, wow, it's terrific. That's what I want to do with my life. And you will change. And change is a good thing. So don't be afraid to change. Don't think that because you started life thinking you had to get involved in computer science or you had to get involved in engineering or some tech. If you find something more interesting, change and do it. Because the people are happiest in this life when they're following their passion, when they're doing something that they love to do. I don't think I've worked a day in my life. My science is my hobby. I love it. I, I don't work. So anyway, Bath turned out to be pretty good. But it was really the headmaster at this school who got me going. There was also one other thing I learned at this school, and that was about examinations. Now, in England, when I was growing up, there was an exam called the 11 plus exam. You had to take this and figure out whether you were going to pursue an academic career and go to a, a, a school devoted to academics, or whether you were going to be just you know, a laborer, technician, something, um, a lesser career. And it was all dependent upon your intellect. Well, so I took the 11 plus examination without even knowing that I'd taken it. We arrived at school one day, and the teacher said, oh, I have some questions here on a form. Can you just please answer the questions and then turn them in when you're finished? And it turned out that was the 11 plus exam. We weren't told it was the 11 plus exam, just took the exam as though it was a, a normal thing to do in class. And I think that is an excellent way to set examinations. Don't ask people to swap for them. You know, don't spend hours, weeks, trying to figure out how you're going to pass this exam, how you're going to get. Either you've got enough knowledge as a result of your education, and you can pass the exam, or you haven't. And this idea of swatting at the last minute is, is terrible. 
I'll tell you why it's terrible. It's because in real life, when you come across a problem that you have to solve, you're not told about it a week ahead of time so that you can really study it. You have to use what you've learned in order to solve that problem. So I was actually pretty great for that. Now, this is the, the city, Bath. A couple of nice pictures here. The picture on the bottom left are the Roman baths that I told you about. And on the right is one of the beautiful architectural features of Bath. That is during the Georgian era, during George, the time of George I. They built these beautiful crescents and beautiful architecture, Bath. And so that makes it really a very, very nice place to go and visit. Now, one of the things that I really found out about um, during my time in Bath was that there were so many things that one could do that were not necessarily directly related to education. I used to love games and puzzles, and my parents encouraged me in this because they saw that I was happy. Most of the time, they didn't know themselves, although my mother... Um, had she not left school when she was 14, I think she could probably have gone to university, uh, but she didn't. But when she found that I was interested in chess, she taught herself to play chess so she could teach me how to play chess. And so she, she was very well dedicated towards uh, her child. Now, after the 11 plus, I went to the grammar school, which is the um, sort of, you know, the academic orientation. It's called the City of Bath Boys School. And I increased, we had a great math teacher. I just love mathematics. And he just inspired me over and over again. We had a terrible chemistry teacher. Um, and the reason he was terrible, at least for me, was that after I got this chemistry set, I used to go down to the library and I would read about chemistry and I'd find out about it. And I learned more chemistry by reading about it myself and doing things in the lab than I ever learned at school. But the most disappointing thing that happened there was we had a terrible physics teacher. He just was not good at teaching physics. And of course, when you finish grammar school, you have to take an exam to go to university. And you take these exams, they're called advanced levels exams. And the first time around, I failed physics. And partly it was because of the teacher, partly it was because I never really understood physics very well until I got to university. And then I discovered that physics was actually mathematics. All of the physics I learned in university was all mathematics, which I love. And so, again, the teacher was not very good at teaching uh, the subject in the way that it was really necessary. <clears throat> now, when I was 17, I learned probably the most important lesson ever in my life. And it came because I was playing billiards and snooker. Now, <clears throat> when we went into the sixth form at school, we spent the first year learning everything you needed to know to pass the advanced level examinations. And in the second year, they just repeated it. They just kept going on and on over this same stuff, and it was boring, unbelievably boring. And so I stopped going. I used to go to school, First thing in the morning, sign in, and then I'd disappear down to the local YMCA. I'd play billions and snooker all day. And then I'd go back at the end of the day to sign out of school and pretend I'd been there all day. Well, this physics teacher, who I didn't really care for, um, found out about this, and he was going to throw me out of school. His absolute goal was to get me out of that school. He would like to destroy my life. But at the time... I was really good at snooker billiards. And it turned out the world champion at snooker, a man called Joe Davis, he was looking for someone to go around and be a sparring partner for him during exhibitions. And I went to audition for that because I was good at the game. I was the West of England junior champion at snooker. And so I went to audition for it. And I thought I was going to be a professional snooker player. That was my goal. And I'm sure if I had been, I would become world champion. I'd be really famous. You'd know me for that. Um, but anyway, turned out the headmaster relented. He said he's not going to throw me out of school. And instead, I can continue. 
But nevertheless, I was playing in a tournament one day, and I had a lucky break. I, I hit a ball I was trying to part, and it didn't pop, but it hit something else, and that did pop. And then the next shot, and so I could continue my break, and the next shot I missed, missed completely. And an old gentleman came up to me. Oh, they can't hear it? You can't hear me? Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, okay. No, no, usually I, I speak too loudly, so. Anyway, so I missed this shot, and afterwards, I was 17, an old gentleman, must have been in his 80s, came up to me and he said, you know, you could be a really good snooker player, but there's something you have to learn, and you have to learn that when you have a lucky break, when something lucky happens when you're playing, you've got to work twice as hard to make sure you take advantage of it. So that the next shot, you've got to concentrate on twice as hard. And this is true. I, I've found that lesson throughout my life, that when something lucky happens, you have to take advantage of it. You've got to find a way to take advantage of it, because everybody has luck. Everybody. But an awful lot of people feel guilty because they had the luck, and maybe the partner or somebody else didn't have it. But if you don't take advantage of it, there's really no point in having it in the first place. So this is something that, that I learned, and I will show you during the course of my talk how this has been beneficial to me. It's been really good, and it will be good for you too. Now, when I left university, um, the high school rather, I couldn't go to Oxford or Cambridge because I'd missed the A-levels. I failed physics the first time around. I had to repeat the year. And there were two universities in England that were very good for chemistry. One was Southampton and the other was Sheffield. I applied to both. Southampton turned me down. Sheffield accepted me. And so I ended up at Sheffield. That too turned out to be a lucky break because I had an excellent education at Sheffield including meeting someone who was probably one of the most important teachers I had during my entire career. Now, the Sheffield University is just north of Derby. It's a, a very nice place, and it was good. Um, I took chemistry, got a bachelor's degree in chemistry, and then went on to do a PhD, and I worked with a man called Ollis. I didn't Meet, he was the professor of chemistry. I didn't meet him very much because I was put into a laboratory with a postdoc, this gentleman from Japan, Kazu Kurosawa. And he is the most important teacher that I had during my life. He taught me how to do chemistry, he taught me what experiments I should be doing, how to interpret the results. He showed me exactly how to do the experiments well. And if things failed, he taught me how to look at the failure uh, and work out what had gone wrong. And I think this is also something I like to pass on to students. Failure is a good thing. Failure is when you learn about stuff. Don't ever let anybody tell you that you know, you're a fool, you're an idiot, or you're not very smart because you had a failure. Bill Gates failed at the first company that he started. But the next one, Microsoft, turned out to be pretty good. Failure is when you really learn in life. And I, I can't stress this enough, and it's very important for parents to know that when their kids fail at something, don't chastise them, don't tell them that they're stupid. Just tell them to go back and find out why they failed so that they can then not fail the next time around. On the bottom left, it is a game, a game of Go, that is very popular in Japan. I, I don't know if you know it at all. Um, it's a wonderful game, and Kazu also taught me how to play that, and also Shogi, which is another Japanese game. Now, after my first year doing my PhD, I had all the results I needed for my thesis. I could have written my thesis then and graduated and gone on, but of course, in England, a certain amount of bureaucracy takes place, and just like there is here in India, and you have to spend three years doing a PhD. 
So at the end of the first year, Kazu went back to Japan, and I started doing experiments on my own. And some worked, some didn't. You know, I wasn't terribly good. But I also spent a lot of time going over to the library reading. And I read this book called The Thread of Life by John Kendrew. And this book also changed my life in ways that I was not expecting. John Kendrew won the Nobel Prize for determining the structure of proteins. So he basically pioneered protein crystallography. And the book talked not so much about that, but it talked about molecular biology and the origins of molecular biology. And by the time I finished that book, I knew that I wanted to be a molecular biologist. So again, another example where something came along, something outside of what I was doing, and it really, I felt passionate about it. I wanted to do this. And I went and talked to the faculty in the chemistry department. Pretty much everybody said there's no such thing as molecular biology. Don't waste your time. Um, be a chemist. Do what you came here to do. But there was one assistant professor, Michael Backburn, who said, no, molecular biology, I, I've heard about it a little bit. It may be OK. If that's what you want to do, do it. So when it came time to do a postdoc, I applied to six different laboratories, all of whom were organic chemists who were working in molecular biology one way or the other. Six. Only one accepted me. Five of them just turned me down. The one who accepted me was a gentleman called Jack Strominger, who was at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin at the time. And he had been working on bacterial cell wall biosynthesis, um, but he accepted me. And two months before I was going to go and work with him, he wrote me a letter and he said, can you just delay coming for a month because I'm moving to Harvard? I've just been appointed a full professor at Harvard. So this is Jack. <clears throat> And so, by chance, by luck, instead of going to the University of Wisconsin, I went to Harvard. That was pretty good. Uh, you know, Harvard was a great university, is a great university, and I had a very good time there. Now, the project that he gave me was one that was finishing up a project that another postdoc had started on bacterial cell wall biosynthesis. And he was trying to sequence a transfer RNA to figure out why it worked in cell wall biosynthesis, but didn't work in protein synthesis. And he was using a somewhat old-fashioned method um, that had been invented by Bob Holly, who eventually got the Nobel Prize for it. But it was just not a particularly clever way to sequence RNA. And again, I started reading, I was reading the literature, and I discovered that there was a man at the MRC lab in Cambridge called Fred Sanger, who had come up with a much better way to sequence RNA. And so I wrote to Fred, and I said, you know, could I come and work in your lab for a little while and learn how to do this so I can bring the techniques back to Harvard, where I'm working, and apply them to this project. Now, Fred Sanger, is a, a very, or was a very special individual. He is one of the few people who won two Nobel Prizes, and he could actually even have won a third. The first one was for learning how to sequence proteins. He developed all the basic methodology to sequence proteins. Then he went on and discovered and made all the really good methodology for sequencing RNA and then went on to sequence DNA and figure out how to do that. He got the prize for DNA, shared it with Wally Gilbert, who actually probably should never have gotten the Nobel Prize for that, because he set sequencing back. His method was way worse than Fred Sanger's. And Wally actually had made another important discovery that would have perhaps easily worth a Nobel Prize. Anyway, but he, he just got it for this. So Fred Sanger was a very modest man, um, even though he won two Nobel Prizes. You would talk to him, and maybe you'd go and have an idea, and you'd say, hey, you know, this would be a great idea. Perhaps we should do this. 
And he would look at you and instead of saying, no, that's stupid, which is what he really thought, he would say, well, perhaps, perhaps that would be okay, but perhaps you should think about doing it this way. And he'd come up with a much better way of doing it. But after the conversation, you felt that, you know, he had sort of validated your thoughts, but without telling you, you were absolutely stupid. And he was himself an incredibly modest man. I first met him in the lab. He was washing the dishes in the lab on a Sunday morning. Can you believe that? Nobel Prize winner washing the dish wet, doing the dishes. And that was just the sort of guy he was. He never wanted you to think that he was smart or better than anybody else. Just a very nice man. So I learned a lot from him. And I've always tried to emulate him when I can, because for me, he is the model of what a good scientist is. Someone super smart, does good work, makes interesting discoveries, but doesn't spend all their time telling you how great he is. Now, after I came back from um, Fred's lab, I set up a sequencing lab at Harvard, and I was the first person, it turned out, by chance, by luck, to be sequencing RNA in the method, using the methods of Fred Sanger in the whole Boston area. And so a lot of people came to me to learn how to do this. I made a lot of friends in those days. And one of those friends was a man called Mark Potashny. And Mark, had, he, he was working with Jim Watson. He was in Jim Watson's group. And he came to me after a seminar one day, and he said, um, Jim Watson is going to come and talk to you because he has a job for you at Cold Spring Harbor Lab. And what Jim wanted was to have someone sequence SV40 DNA. This was one of the first tumor viruses that was recognized. And he had a cancer center at Cold Spring Harbor. So I waited and waited and nothing happened. And then a couple of weeks later, Mark came to me and he said, well, you know, Jim Watson doesn't actually know who you are. Perhaps you could go and introduce yourself. So, you know, Jim Watson is what of Watson and Helix, double Helix fame. Um, Watson and Crick, rather. And so anyway, so I go and I knock on his door, and I go in, and his first words were, I want you to come to Cold Spring Harbor and sequence SV40 DNA. And, I, you know, this was a start, and so then he talked to me a little bit about Cold Spring Harbor. And as I was going out, he said, perhaps you should come and visit Cold Spring Harbor, and so you can see what the place is about, he said. But it's not an interview. The job is yours. You've got the job. So that was my first experience of getting a job, uh, which was an interesting one, a little bit different from most. When I left the office, I asked my supervisor, um, Jack Strominger, you know, did he know about this? He said, no, Jim had never talked to him. In fact, they used to fight all the time. And the reason I got offered the job was because of Mark Potashny, who I taught how to sequence RNA, and obviously he thought I was OK. So anyway, I took the job at Cold Spring Harbor, I went down there, and when I got there, I discovered there were already two groups sequencing SV40 using exactly the method RNA sequencing that I would use. So, you know, at that time to sequence DNA, you had to copy the DNA into RNA, sequence the RNA, and then put everything back together. And one thing I don't like doing is competing unnecessarily. And I also don't like to do things that people tell me to do. Um, you know, my wife always is uh, complaining about this, but I, I like to do things that I thought to do would be good, not what somebody else thought would be good to do. And so when I got to Cold Spring Harbor and discovered there were two groups already doing this, I thought, well, Maybe I can find another way to sequence DNA and actually develop methods for sequencing DNA rather than doing it by copying it from RNA. And the reason for that was, again, because of a lecture I went to when I was at Harvard by this man in the top left-hand corner. His name is Dan Nathans. And he had shared the prize for discovering and using restriction enzymes in order to study DNA. And what he'd done, he took the enzyme called endonuclease R that Ham Smith in the bottom left had found, and he showed that if you took SV40 DNA 
and cut it with this endonuclease, which recognized a relatively short sequence, it would put SV40 and make it into a number of small fragments. And one of the reasons that RNA sequencing was developed before DNA sequencing is that there were lots of small RNA molecules to practice on, but no small DNA molecules. And I saw this SV40 cut into pieces as a way of generating small DNA molecules upon which you could develop techniques for sequencing. At the time, when I went to Cold Spring Harbor, there were three other enzymes already known. And so the first thing I did was purify this one, discovered that it was actually two enzymes, not one. And then I purified the other three. And then I started looking for more. And it turned out that everywhere we looked, we found a new restriction enzyme, and it recognized a different sequence from the ones that were already known. Um, if you ask me how many sequences are out there today that are recognized, it's in the thousands. There are thousands. But it occurred to me that maybe we could use these to sequence DNA. And so that's what I started doing. And at that point, Jim said, well, I'm going to fire you. I don't want you here at Cold Spring Harbor because I got you here to sequence SV40 using the techniques you know how to use. I, I don't want to hear about all of this. And fortunately, I had run into a man called Norton Zinder, who was a professor at Rockefeller University. And by chance, by pure luck, I had been going to a meeting in Belgium. We landed in the airport at Brussels, and I was taking the train to Ghent, which was where the meeting was being held. And sitting next to me on the train was this gentleman, Norton Zinder, because he was going to the same meeting. And we started talking, and it turned out he thought restriction enzymes were very important, and we became really good friends. Now, he was also probably the only real friend that Jim Watson ever has. He's, he, 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 they got on really well. And every time that Jim mentioned he was going to fire me, I would talk to Norton, and he would say, oh, let me deal with this. And he would talk to Jim and convince him not to fire me. This probably happened 15, 20 times while I was at Cold Spring Harbor. So this is also something quite important. It's very good if you're a little bit different and you want to do what you want to do and what your supervisor or the, um, whoever is looking after you doesn't want you to do. Good to have a friend who can speak up for you uh, and tell the, uh, the person who wants to fire you uh, that maybe they should think again and not fire you. Anyway, so that worked out pretty well. Now, it turns out, of course, that restriction enzymes were unbelievably important in starting the biotechnology industry. These were the enzymes that really allowed biotechnology to take off. And people were not necessarily interested in using them for sequencing, which was what I originally planned on doing, but they were using them to map DNA, to map genes, to pull out fragments that had individual genes on them so they could clone them. And it was that they, they were just the backbone. And people used to come to meetings at Cold Spring Harbor, and they would have a tube of their favorite DNA in their pocket. And they'd come down to my lab, and they'd say, hey, do you have a restriction enzyme that will cut this DNA? And so we set up a little set of tubes at the time um, this was maybe we already had 20 enzymes. And we would set up a tube with a little bit of each enzyme in, and they could put their DNA in and see if something would cut it. And it was obvious that these things were going to be incredibly important to advance uh, biology, to advance biotechnology. And I thought, well, and you couldn't buy them. You know, there was no commercial source of these. You either made them yourself, or you became friends with me and convinced me to send them some. And we gave out the strains. We told people how to make the ones that they wanted. It was obvious there was a business here. And so I went to Jim Watson, and I said, look, we should start a company associated with Cold Spring Harbor. And we should use the profits from selling these restriction enzymes to support the research at Cold Spring Harbor. Now, a very simple business model. 
He said, oh, no, he, he didn't think you could make money that way. And plus, <clears throat> very dirty to be associated with commercial business. And, you know, this was back in 1974. And so he didn't want to do it. He wanted nothing to do with it. In fact, he was actually discouraging me from trying to do anything about it. Again, Norton stepped in and said, well, maybe the idea wasn't completely alien. But anyway, I started looking around and I found that there was a, a distributor in, up in the Boston area who was planning on selling this very first restriction enzyme that Ham Smith had discovered. And so I called them up and I said, you know, I've got, at the time I had 30 enzymes that had been discovered in my lab and people wanted pretty much all of them. And so I said, you know, I have all of these enzymes. Would you consider making these enzymes and making them available? And they said, well, it's not actually us. It's a fellow called Don Combe in Beverly. Why don't you talk to him? So I talked to him. I called him up. He said, oh, come up and visit. And at the time, his lab was in a basement in Beverly underneath a hairdressing salon. It was a makeshift lab. There was he, his wife, and one technician, and that was New England Biolabs. And I said that, you know, I thought they could make these enzymes, they could sell them, and that they could make money this way, but don't go through a distributor who you have to pay money, just sell them directly. And so at the end of the day, he said, yeah, that's a good idea. I said, you know, I can give you the names and addresses of people who I know will buy them because I'm giving them away at the moment. And so that was how Biolabs got started. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. So one of the things that I did at Cold Spring Harbor when I had postdocs and students come in, I, all, I gave them all the job of finding a, restrict, a new restriction enzyme. They would open up, a, grow a bacterium, check it, find the restriction enzyme, purify it, and then there was a paper. In those days, you could get a very nice paper just by purifying and characterizing one of these enzymes. And that was easy. It's what I call a bread and butter project. It's one of these where, you know, a, a student can guarantee getting a paper and they don't have to be very smart. It, it's just, you know, a little discovery and you can publish it. But for all of those postdocs, they would all get another project to do something that was more risky, more interesting, um, that may or may not necessarily produce a publication. And this one gentleman, um, Richard Gelinas, had been a, a student at Harvard who I'd met when I was a postdoc there. And we'd kept in contact, and he came down to be a postdoc with me. And the project that we devised for him was to find out if the sequences in eukaryotic DNAs, in higher organism DNA, was the same as in bacteria to tell the RNA polymerase where to start making RNA so that the gene could eventually become and express its protein. So we started on this, and the idea was a pretty straightforward one. The idea was, let us find the sequence at the very start of the RNA, at the five prime end of the RNA. And if we can do this and then sequence the DNA that codes for it, the sequence just upstream of that start point, would tell us that would be the promoter. And we knew of two bacterial promoters, LAC and Lambda, and they were pretty similar to one another. And so the project was just, you know, can we find out whether a eukaryotic promoter is the same or whether it's different? Because higher organisms and bacteria have pretty different properties. So I came up with, with an idea as to how we might do this. <coughs> The idea was to, these are all the RNAs that are made by adenovirus. We first tried with the early RNAs, but we just couldn't get enough RNA to make the experiments work. Late in infection, <coughs> adenovirus turns off all of the host RNA synthesis, just makes its own RNAs. And at the top of this diagram, you'll see there are a whole series of different RNAs that are made and we knew about this because there were other labs at Cold Spring Harbor that had been mapping them. They did all of this. So I came up with, with an interesting experiment that took advantage of the fact 
that at the five prime end at the very start of all of the RNAs that are made as messenger RNAs in higher organisms, they have this peculiar cap structure. They, they have a special chemical structure at the five prime end. And it actually, in a way, looks like the three prime end, which has poly A on it. But this has a, an inverted guanosine residue. And it has two hydroxyl groups. So the experiment we wanted to do is shown here. We take the messenger RNA, a mix of all of them, cut them with this ribonuclease that cuts after every G residue. Wherever there's a G in the sequence, it cuts. And you will end up with three kinds of oligonucleotides. One is this capped oligonucleotide at the extreme five prime end. Then all the internal ones, which are just a nucleotides ending in a G. And then finally, the three prime end that had all the poly A in it. We came up with an easy way to separate the poly A. You just hybridize it to oligo DT and you can get rid of it. The others, um, I came up with a clever way of capturing just this five prime end based on the cap structure. And so the idea, we make late adeno RNA, take out the three prime ends, get the five prime end, and then we spread out all of these five prime ends on a gel, and we're expecting to see 10, 12, 15 different oligonucleotides corresponding to the start point of the RNA. Well, Richard did the experiment, and this was the result. On the left, if you made the RNA about eight, 10 hours after infection, you had two spots, not 10 or 12, just two. And if you do it even later, you find just one. It turned out that these two corresponded to a cyclic form of the other. So they were just chemically related, uh, but one was a cyclic form of the other. So anyway, so Richard did this experiment and got this result, and I said, you know, we know we, we've got to get 10 or 12. You screwed up. Go back and do it again. So he went back and did it again and got the same result. And again and again and kept getting the same result. And I said, why don't you let me do the experiment? I'll show you how to do it properly. You know, I'm, I'm more experienced than you. I did the experiment a couple of times and got this same result. So what this experiment was showing us was that these 10, 12, 15 messenger RNAs that were all located and coded at different points in the adenovirus genome all had exactly the same five prime end. How was that possible? Well, it could be possible if this sequence was repeated all over the adenovirus genome. And so we did some experiments to see if that was true, and it wasn't. We quickly found out that was not true. So the question was, how do they all get the same five prime end? Is this something that's added to the RNA afterwards? Well, we couldn't find any evidence for that. And then we discovered that if you hybridize the RNA to a segment of adenovirus, and then treat it with ribonuclease very gently, that you lose the cap structure. It takes off the poly A, it takes off the cap, and you lose it. And so it showed conclusively this was not coded on the RNA right next to the main body. So we thought hard and long about how to do this, what might be happening. And it occurred to me that maybe RNA synthesis was being primed by another RNA. There was another RNA with this structure on it, and that was priming the synthesis of all these late RNAs. So <clears throat> we did some experiments to see if that was a possibility. Oh, this was the paper that came out about the adenovirus. So this up on the top left is a schematic, on the top rather, is a schematic showing you and what we anticipated. So we anticipated the main body of the RNA matched the DNA exactly, but the right-hand side, the three prime end, there was a poly A. We knew that that was added by an enzyme after transcription. And on the left, and we thought there's this sequence sitting out that maybe is from the primer. And it turns out if you take RNA-DNA hybrids, that the, you can form these things called R-loops, shown here on the, the bottom 
of the slide, because DNA-RNA hybrids are more stable than DNA-DNA hybrids. So you just warm them up a little bit, and they form this structure. And the nice thing about that is you can see it in the electron microscope very easily. And so the experiment we thought of was uh, this R-loop experiment, and we thought, we'll make these RNA-DNA hybrids, we'll guess where the primer is. Because it turned out in adenovirus, there was a small RNA that was made, and we thought that that might be the primer. And so we took the coding sequence for that RNA, and then just used it to make a DNA probe hybridized to the RNA, to the RNA loop. And if our theory was correct, then we would see a nice hybridization that you could see in the electron microscope at the five prime end. We thought of this experiment, or I thought of the experiment, um, on a Saturday morning. And Richard and I um, are not electron microscopists, but close by was a lab that had some electron microscopists, two very talented ones. And so we went and talked to them, <clears throat> and we said, you know, this is the experiment we've thought of. Do you think you could do it for us? And they looked at it and they said, well, you know, it's never quite been done like this before, but yeah, sure, we think we could do it. And so Richard went and made the reagents necessary to do this experiment. He had them ready by Tuesday. And the two electron microscopists are shown here on the left, Louise Chow and Tom Broker. And Louise did the experiment on the Tuesday morning. And the very first molecule she looked at in the electron microscope looked exactly like my drawing in the previous slide. Well, maybe, maybe not exactly. If you actually look at the bottom right-hand corner, instead of the DNA hybridizing at just one place, it was hybridizing at two places. And this was the discovery of split genes, of introns, exons, and so on. And she kept looking, all the molecules looked like this. And there was a lot of work went on later, but by that afternoon, we knew that our theories that the messenger RNA made in adenovirus was composed of at least two parts, a cap, a five prime end that was coded in one place, and the main body coded somewhere else. And people were already talking about Nobel Prizes that afternoon. And everybody went and told all their friends about this. It turned out that many people already had enough data in their notebooks that confirmed that this was what was going on. I even gave a little talk at an RNA meeting that was held at Cold Spring Harbor a little after this discovery. I talked about it, told them what we'd found. And one of the people who was presenting showed a slide and said, We've had this data for a long time, and I couldn't interpret it until I heard of this discovery. And now he could interpret his data beautifully. And that was generally the case. So it didn't take very long for it to become accepted. <clears throat> it did take a long time to get the Nobel Prize, though. Um, which, oh, I have to, another story I should tell you. So this was the paper that described the discovery. It's called An Amazing Sequence Arrangement for the Five Prime Ends of Adenovirus RNA. Now, my co-authors didn't think we should put the word amazing in the title of a paper. They said, you know, that's not very scientific. It sounds more like magic um, than it does like science. And so I talked to them, and we had some conversations and a few beers, and pretty soon they agreed that this was OK. So we sent it in. There were four reviewers. All the reviewers said this is a wonderful discovery, but amazing isn't the right word to use. You know, why don't you use a, a nice scientific word to explain it? And the editor wrote back and said, well, we're going to accept your paper, but you've got to change the title. And so I called him up, and, and we had a little conversation, and we talked about some of the other things that the reviewers had talked about. And then during the conversation, I said, his name was Ben Lewin. I said, Ben, what did you think when you first heard about this? Oh, it was amazing, he said. I rest my case, and um, this was the result. And as far as I know, this is the first time that the word amazing has ever been used in the title of a scientific paper. It has been used since then, but, but not before then, as far as I can find out. 
Anyway, I ended up getting the Nobel Prize in 1993. I shared it with Phil Sharp, who had independently made the same discovery at MIT. Phil and I had actually known each other at Cold Spring Harbor. He'd been a postdoc when I first went there. And we actually have one paper together from that time. But he made the discovery completely independently. So that was good. We, we had a really good time in Stockholm. You know, when you go to get the prize, it's presented on December 10th, which is the anniversary of Alfred Nobel's death. And you go there a few days early, get acclimatized, go to a few parties. The Swedes really know how to throw a party. If ever you want to um, run a party and have someone organize it, find a Swedish person for you. The, uh, we had 10 days of celebrations, and every day something special happened at lunch or at dinner. But if that was the only thing that had happened during the year, it would have been the highlight of the year. Can you imagine that? 20 of these things, just day after day after day. I was actually rather happy to get away at the end of it because it was very tiring. But it was good. It's, uh, you know, I recommend it to everybody. I, I, I wouldn't say don't do it for that. It's good. So anyway, so we had a really good time there. But one of the things that you have to do when you go to pick up the prize is you have to give a lecture in front of the Nobel Committee and a lot of Swedes and all these people. And I, normally most people, when they talk about their lecture, what they do is they talk about all the fabulous work they've done building on their discovery. And, you know, for instance, that was the basis of Phil Sharp's lecture, but most people, that's what you do. But I hadn't actually worked in the field for quite a long time. I, I moved out of the field. And I'd been working on something called DNA methylation. Um, these are enzymes that put a methyl group onto DNA uh, to protect against restriction enzymes. And we'd been trying to get a crystal structure of this for a couple of years. And we got a structure just before, two months before I had to go to Stockholm. And so we discovered something rather interesting in that structure. It's shown here, Zhaodong Cheng, who was a, a postdoc at Cold Spring Harbor, and produced this structure. And what he found was that when the enzyme binds to DNA in order to do some chemistry on the base, which is in the middle of the DNA, flips the base 180 degrees right out of the helix, does its chemistry, and then pops it back in again. And it turns out now, Almost every enzyme that we know about that does chemistry on the DNA bases, this is how it does it. It flips the base out, does the chemistry, let it go back in again. So this was the basis for my Nobel lecture. I always thought, you know, if you've made a discovery and you want to tell people about it, well, the Nobel Committee in Stockholm is not a bad group to tell it to. Anyway, so that was, that was a nice thing. It was a, nice to have a discovery. Lucky to have a discovery like that. And I also would say, well, if you go back and think about how we made the discovery of splicing, it was because we did this experiment that failed. We were looking for a promoter. It failed miserably. But we did the post-mortem, and by luck, it turned out that the discovery, the reason that the original experiment hadn't worked, was because nature was trying to tell us something. It was trying to tell us that our basic ideas about how adenovirus makes its RNA is very different from the way in which it's made in bacteria. So that was good. Now, I just take a little digression and tell you a little about New England Biolabs. So I told you that I tried to get Cold Spring Harbor, Jim Watson, to set up a company to start making restriction enzymes. I went up to Boston, met Don Combe. This is a picture taken uh, before he died a couple of years ago. Um, this was taken beforehand. But it was, he, he was great because he'd been an associate professor at Harvard Medical School, and he was in one of these departments where they never give tenure. And so he'd left. He was pretty disgusted. Most people in that position would go and get a wonderful professorship somewhere else. But he, he didn't think this was a, a proper way to treat people. And so his idea was to start a company, make money, and then use the profits to support research. Just the idea that I'd had with Jim Watson. 
And so our minds were so attuned. We, we both wanted the same thing. And it turned out it was quite easy to convince him to um, start selling these restriction enzymes. In the first year, starting about the middle of 1975, in one year, he sold $200,000 worth of restriction enzymes. And that was the start of New England Biolabs. From then on, we never looked back. And we've been going now since 1975. We've been doing really well during the vaccine crisis, the pandemic. The enzymes that Moderna needed and that Pfizer needed in order to make their vaccines, to make the messenger RNA vaccines, they purchased from us. This was incredibly profitable business, a good time for us. And it also, it also really shows the values that we place on trying to do something good for humanity. We've had a big program of parasitology, um, studying diseases in Africa. We have opened up and helped start a number of labs in Africa and elsewhere. And we've always wanted to really take care of humanity whenever we can, and also to do what we can to support science in developing countries. So that's, that's been very nice. Don's a great guy. So starting from three, I was their fourth employee. I was just their consultant. Um, now we have almost 700 people worldwide who work for the company. 360 are working in Ipswich, Massachusetts, just north of Boston, which is our headquarters. And out of those 360, 100 are doing research, all paid for by the company, not with the idea of making products for the company. We have a separate group who does all of that, but just to do basic research, make discoveries, uh, and to do what we can to uh, help molecular biology. One of the things that that's good for us for is that we use all our own reagents. We know if they work, if they don't work. We can suggest reagents they should make that they would work. And so we, we've had a very positive influence on the company. When we left the basement in Beverly, the first place we went to is in 1994, North Beverly. And then we moved to our present campus of Ipswich, and that is growing. This was the very first catalog that we produced. And what we did in it was something very novel. We had a list of the enzymes that we sell, and then we had an appendix, which listed all of the known restriction enzymes at the time and had information in it that was useful to the people who were buying our products. We were the first company to do that. Nowadays, everybody does it. They all do it. We also put it all out on our website. But this was the really start of that movement to um, have more than just pricing information. This is the current state of where we are. It is rather interesting. The site itself was owned by the Roman Catholic Church when we moved in, when we bought it. And in order to buy it, we had to get permission from the Pope in order to be able to buy the property and then set up a company there. And I always thought we should take the catalog, take a picture of the Pope in his Pope mobile waving and put it on the front of the catalog. But our marketing department didn't think that was such a good idea. I still think it's a good idea. I think that would have been fun. So we, uh, we do well. We're very environmentally conscious. We have a, a solar, a lot of solar panels on the roof. We have a water treatment plant so that the water coming out from our place is cleaner than the water in the Ipswich River that it drains into. So we're very environmentally conscious. This is a picture of the main hall in the company. And on the right, our new CEO, Sal Russello, who is himself originally a researcher, um, now running the company, very good guy, but he believes heavily in the value of research. We're a private company, so we can get away with this. If we were not a private company, we couldn't do the research we do, because as soon as you go public, all the shareholders want the profits, and they don't want you spending it on research. So we intend to stay as a private company. Now, I'll go on and tell you a few stories about what happened to me after winning the Nobel Prize. 
There were a number of things that happened. I got invited to do all sorts of interesting, fun things, but I suddenly had a, a reasonable amount of money. You know, even you pay taxes on it. You know, there are t only two countries where you pay tax on the Nobel Prize. The US is one of them, and South Africa is the other. Absolutely nuts. Anyway, so even after paying all the tax, I could still afford to put a croquet lawn in front of my house. When I'd been on sabbatical in Sidney Brenner's lab in 1978, I fell in love with croquet. It's a wonderful game, really a good game. And the nice thing is it's a cross between snooker and chess. Snooker because you have to learn how you can hit the balls and make them go where you want them to go. And chess because once you realize what you can and can't do, everything is strategy. It's all strategy, just like chess. So I love this game. So I used most of my Nobel Prize money to put this croquet lawn in front of my house. And it actually got featured in a Scientific American article in which they wrote an article about how people use their Nobel Prize money. You know, because most of them give them to charities and good causes and all sorts. And they said, but you know, some fritter the money away on pastimes, um, like put in a croquet lawn in front of their house. But it wasn't a fritter, it was good. I've had more enjoyment out of this than almost anything. So it was good. Picture on the left also tells you something else about me. I love humor. I think laughing is so important under any possible circumstance. And there's a, an organization in Boston run by a man called Mark Abrahams that sets up something called the Ig Nobel Prizes. And these are prizes that are given to scientists who've done something when you read the title or the paper, it makes you laugh. And then you start to think about it and you realize it's actually quite an important, interesting piece of science. But when you first hear about it, you just want to laugh. And so they have a big show down at Harvard every year. And there are a few of us laureates, four or five of us typically. We go and we present the prizes to these people who had written the interesting thing. And one of the ladies who's associated with that is a photographer. And one year, she decided she was going to put together a calendar called the Stud Muffins of Science. It was basically featuring good-looking scientists, um, you know, in much the way that Playboy used to feature good-looking women um, there. And they asked me if I would be Dr. December. And so that's that picture in the bottom left was me as Dr. December um, on my, sitting on my croquet lawn in a, a lawn chair. And it was kind of interesting, you know, my wife said, what? You didn't say yes to this, did you? And so I said, yeah, sure, it's fun. And she said, oh, no, 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 it's degrading. She said, I'm not going to have anything to do with it. So she left the house when the camera crew came up to take the photographs. But since then, she's realized it's okay. So she, she can live with it now. Um, but it, it's pretty typical of um, my wife's reactions to things that she thinks uh, uh, not appropriate. Now, of course, one of the things that happens, you get all sorts of honors and honorary degrees. You get invited to come and talk at conferences like this, which I like because I love interacting with students. So that's very nice. I had a couple of buildings named after me. I got knighted by then Prince Charles, now King Charles. And the sword that they use sort of tap you on the shoulder was a little bit scary. It's got a very sharp blade on it, you know, and Prince Charles was there and put in, and his hand was not that steady. And I was a little worried that, you know, I, I might end up with an injury from that, but I didn't, it worked out okay. Now, the other thing that's happened, when I won the Nobel Prize beforehand, I used to speak my mind about things. You know, if something needed complaining about, I would complain. And, I, I was never reluctant to say how I felt about things. And people sometimes would listen, but never act on anything I suggested. But after I won the Nobel Prize, people really started to listen. And some people even acted on things that I had suggested. And I thought, well, you know, this is perhaps a good thing. Maybe this is something good that I can use the Nobel Prize for. And so the first thing I did, I talked to one or two um, other laureates, including Harold Varmus, who was very keen on open access publication. And so we started a movement to get the Nobel laureates behind 
pushing open access publication. And this started in 1995, just two years after I won. But if you look now, the open access movement is really going very strong. And there's an awful lot of publishers now who realize that this is the way they should be making the information available, not using it just as a money-making venture, but really try to do something good for science. Now, I've run a number of other campaigns in which I've gathered Nobel laureates for good causes. And one of the most successful involved a situation in Libya where there'd been an outbreak of HIV at the children's hospital in Benghazi. 400 children had all been infected with HIV, got HIV, got AIDS. And Gaddafi, who was president of Libya, was sure that this was deliberate. And so he first of all blamed Mossad, but that clearly didn't fly. And then he discovered that there were five Bulgarian nurses and one Palestinian student who were working in the hospital in Benghazi. And he blamed them. He put them in jail, tortured them. Two or three confessed to stop the torture. And then they all ended up on death row in Libya. Now, I'd heard about this when it first came out, and it, it, it was pretty obvious to anybody who knew about medical practices in many African, many developing countries, they reuse the needles. They don't use separate needles when they do um, injections and so on. And we were pretty certain that it was just poor hygiene within the hospital that caused this. And in fact, they had a trial of the nurses and some scientists got up and said that nobody listened. Gaddafi was sure that this was the problem. And then when I heard that they'd been put on death row, I thought, well, maybe, maybe now we could get the laureates involved. I rounded up a little over 100 laureates, and we wrote a letter to Gaddafi. And we said, this is not right. You have to go back, look at the evidence, look at the scientific evidence. And we're pretty certain you will find that these nurses were not doing this deliberately, and they shouldn't be on death row. I took that letter and went to the UN embassy um, for Libya, talked to the Libyan ambassador, and I said, would you give this letter to Gaddafi? Would you make sure he sees it? And let's see if we can get some action. In the meantime, I'd been talking to the foreign office in London. Well, I, I talked to the US State Department, but they had no diplomatic relations with Libya and they weren't interested. I talked to the foreign office in London and they were interested. And they actually started to do something, get some other European countries involved in this. Um, and they, they were incredibly helpful. They were, they were really very good. And, but they did it because we had 100 laureates, you know, all saying, hey, you've got to do something. So a couple of weeks after I went to see the Libyan ambassador, I got a phone call from Gaddafi's son, Saif al-Islam, who said, would you come to Tripoli and talk to us about this? So I get on a plane, fly to Tripoli, stayed at the British Embassy in Tripoli for two or three days, and then I got a call one night, 11 o'clock at night, asking if I would go and talk to Saif al-Islam, which I did. I went, we sat in a room, the two of us, I explained everything that I knew, and at the end of that call, at the end of that talk, he said, we're going to let them go. And so they were released from prison, from death row in Libya. And what I discovered from that experience is that by gathering large numbers of Nobel laureates, even though we may not be able to do something ourselves, we can actually encourage people who can do something to do it. And so I've been running Nobel campaigns uh, about for humanitarian causes and also for when science is being misused in some way. And we've had about 50 causes or so now that we've been doing. We have another one that is just starting that is aimed at Argentina, where the new president who's just been elected, is he wants to defund science, doesn't want to put any money into science. He won't have a science minister. It just is going to devastate the scientific output from Argentina. And that would be a great shame. They've done some good science there. They're very prominent members of the community. 
So we're going to see what we can do if we can get some publicity around that. Uh, and so that will be good if we can do it. Now, I want to finish by talking about the importance of luck. Right throughout this talk, I've tried to say and let you know when something lucky has happened and how important it's been. I would encourage all of you in this audience, look at your own lives and see where luck took you one way rather than the other. And I think you'll be surprised at how often luck has played a part in your life. Billiards was the first thing that happened to me. Kazu Kurosawa, totally lucky. You know, I just got put in a lab with him. Going to Harvard instead of Wisconsin, pure luck. Looking for promoters in adenovirus. You know, we did an experiment, it failed. We did a post-mortem. And by chance, by luck, made a huge discovery. It could have been some trivial explanation for this. You know, you can think of lots of trivial... If it had been just a, a, a primer, if there was just an RNA priming all of this, that wouldn't have been such a big discovery. But split genes, huge discovery, enabled us to interpret the human genome sequence, to know where the genes were and all the rest of it. So that was good. Something I didn't tell you about yet is taking an early plane. I'm sure you're probably all aware of the incident in the US, in New York, in 9-11, where a terrorist plane went into the first of the world trade towers and everybody on board was killed. I was booked on that plane until two weeks before it took off. I was going to a conference in California. The plane started in Boston and it was going to California but got diverted. The conference I was going to got moved forward one day, and so I took that plane the day before. That was pretty good, you know? I wouldn't be here talking to you about this today if I, you know, if the conference hadn't moved. I didn't move the conference, somebody else moved it, right? Luck, your luck. Another incident, the Unabomber. I don't know if you ever heard about the Unabomber. This was a, an asso assistant professor, or associate professor at MIT, who went crazy. And he started sending letters out to all sorts of people complaining about things. And he, he was totally messed up. And some of these letters had bombs. The very last batch of letters he sent, he sent five letters. One of them had a bomb. I got one of the letters, but I didn't get the bomb. That was pretty good, too. So I'm happy about that. At the bottom, <coughs> I talk about the fact that you know, my entire scientific career after I moved to Cold Spring Harbor was starting to work on restriction modification systems. I went there because I thought I could use them to sequence DNA, and instead they became a key component of the biotech industry. You know, the biotech industry would not have taken off the way it did if we had not found these restriction enzymes. Of the first hundred restriction enzymes that were known, 70 of them were discovered in my lab at Cold Spring Harbor. 70 of the first 100. We started New England Biolabs, made everything possible. Researchers could buy these things. That was luck. That, that was really very, very lucky. And the last thing I want to do is to talk about another issue that I've become very interested in recently. And this is the fact that in science, women are often treated very badly. They're not really treated properly. A very good book on the left is written by Kate Zanicki about a scientist, Nancy Hopkins, who was a prof his, used to be a professor, she's um, retired now, was a professor at MIT, and when she got, first got the job as an assistant professor, she was very badly mistreated. And after a while, she really started to look into it, measured find all the data to show ways in which men were being treated better than women. And she went, organized all of the female professors at MIT. They went and talked to the president, and they got things changed. They were able to get some changes made. The middle book, oh, and at the bottom, is a very good documentary about not just Nancy, but some other scientists, female scientists who were mistreated. The book in the middle is from this last year's Nobel Prize winner, Katy Kering, Carico, who got the prize for messenger RNA vaccines. And she, she is terrific. You read that story, you'll find it very hard to know why she just continued, continued, continued. 
She has been so mistreated in her career, you wouldn't believe it. But the book I would recommend especially is this one on the right called Invisible Women, in which the author had gathered data on ways in which women are discriminated against by men, and we often don't realize it. So one of the common things is many people treat men and women as though they're equal and that the expectations should be the same, ignoring the fact that it is the women who have children, it's the women who have periods every month, the women who go home and look after the family and take, they have so much more responsibility than men in most cases, and yet they don't get, we don't look at it and say, hey, we have to make allowance for this. And after reading that book, I noticed that I too, there are many times in which I've not treated women correctly. And I think it's very good if all the men in the audience read this and see the ways in which you can avoid mistreating women. Um, women are fabulous, you know. They have a very different view of science. They have a different view of how to do experiments. They're really great. And we need to make sure that they're treated equally, they're treated properly, and that when they're different from us and have to deal with different issues from us men, we make allowance for that. We, we don't look down on them because they don't have as much time to work at home because they're looking after the home. So anyway, I want to leave with that note. I think it's very important. Those books are great. I, I thoroughly enjoyed reading them and I learned a lot. And I hope that in the future, I will treat women a lot better than I have in the past. So thank you all. If there are any questions, I'm happy to. Yeah, it's an open mic. Anyone can um, ask questions. Hello. Hi, sir. Thank you for that wonderful session. You mentioned many times about luck. So being a scientist, do you believe in ideas like fate or God or there is some supernatural being who is bestowing these lucks? As a, as a student of philosophy, you know, I would like to know where this luck comes from. Okay. I'm an atheist. I used to give lectures. I used to give lectures about how science led me to atheism. I really do not have, I, I see no evidence for God, zero. So why would I believe in something I see no evidence for? And you know, luck is luck. You're walking down the road, banana skin there, some people tread on it and fall, some don't. No one is looking over at that, it's just luck. It happens, things happen, everything happens. There, there is no supernatural being out there, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you, sir, for a nice talk. So now the current threat is antimicrobial resistance, uh, which is a major threat to humanity. So whether our bio labs is working towards uh, anti, uh, some trying to solve solution for antimicrobial resistance. Thank you. So, the answer there is no. Uh, the, the philosophy behind the company is we want to make reagents to enable good research to be done. Okay? We're not working ourselves directly on medical problems, but 
we provide lots of enzymes that people working on medical problems need. And for instance, if you think that there is some enzyme that could make a big difference in your research or something by way of a, a, an enzyme or DNA or whatever, let me know because we're always looking for new ideas. We can't think of everything ourselves and we respond quite well usually to customers. But we've deliberately tried not to get involved in medical issues ourselves because that requires getting a lot, you, you just hit all the regulations and you run into loads of problems getting approval for all of these things, incredibly expensive to do it, but we want to make sure that everybody else who does want to get involved, that they can do it and that we sell them the best reagents we can. Hello, sir. So you have spoken about your past playing of snooker and luck involved in the same which is involved in our life success too. So different people have different situations of luck around them with the various levels of head start. So what will be your advice for the people who don't have the unfair advantage of it? Like to stay focused and confident towards working the, towards their goal. So are you asking me what to do if you don't have any luck? You do what, have What luck. will be your advice? You do have luck. Just make sure that you recognize it when it happens. An awful lot of people have luck and don't recognize it. For instance, you're at this institute here. How did you get here? Right? How did you get here? Did you apply to many places? Or did you just apply to this one? So, you know, these kinds of decisions, very often it's luck. Some anonymous committee that they don't know you, they're looking at something written and they make a decision. Sometimes they make the right decision, sometimes the wrong decision. But I guarantee everybody, everybody has luck. And if you look back, just it's worth spending half an hour sometime, maybe on a plane or when you've got nothing else to do, look back and see how luck played a role in your life. And then ask yourself, did you take advantage of that luck when it came your way? So. Thank you, sir. Hello, sir. So I'm Ishita from Chemical Engineering. My question to you is about uh, what are your views on gene therapy? Okay, so, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of genetically modified organisms. Gene therapy, if it's done in a way such as trying to cure sickle cell anemia, which has just been approved, a gene therapy to do that in England, that can be very, very good. I think if it's used to solve diseases, it's good. If it's used to manufacture, you know, children with new traits, I don't think that's good at all. That's not something we should be doing. And especially we don't know how to do it safely at the moment. And that also is a big concern. But we will. We absolutely will. But we need to set standards and say what is acceptable and what isn't. And trying to, you know, get children who are taller than their fathers that's not something that gene therapy is good for. We, we just shouldn't be doing that. Curing disease, curing genetic diseases, that's great. I think this is good. It's, you know, it's just another form of medicine. Okay. Sir, you mentioned that if bio, biolabs goes public, then uh, it might get pressure from uh, capitalists. So my question is to you, like how capitalist and uh, politics is influencing uh, the science and research? Yeah. Uh -huh. huh. Well, you know, I, I could talk for rather a long time about that. So, personally, I think capitalism is not a good system. I think one of the worst things humans ever did was to invent money. Money leads to so much corruption, so many wrong decisions that, that it's awful. And capitalism, this idea that you need more and more of it all the time, I want to know what do these millionaires do with their money? They sit at home and count it at night? You know, money is there to be spent, to be spent on something good for humanity. It's not there just to count in your bank account at night. So I, I'm not a big fan of capitalism. Politicians, you know, I always used to say that I thought 10,000 lawyers at the bottom of the sea was a good start. I'm starting to think 10,000 politicians at the bottom of the sea would be a good start. So many politicians who achieve power the only thing they're interested in is themselves. They don't really care about the people within the country. And, and this is concerning. I, I think we have to find a better way of electing politicians who can help us. 
And unfortunately, the current election systems are themselves um, almost against the idea of getting the good people. Really good people won't run and become politicians because the obstacles are so great. They got to go out and gather money that maybe they don't want to, it, it can be a problem. So I, I think we have to find some better ways to do democracy, to be honest. But you know, it was Churchill who always said, well, democracy is a flawed system, but it's the best we have. And so we, we really, if we could find better ways and do it better, I think we would all benefit from that, and science especially. Okay. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. Uh, so I am from the Metallurgical and Materials Engineering Department. My friend is uh, here also, he's from the same department. So we both are going for a PhD. Uh, you are not lucky enough to go into Wisconsin, but I am lucky enough to go into Wisconsin. So I'm, I'll be doing my PhD there. And he's going to PSL Paris for his PhD. Okay. So like uh, as a very new student to the journey of PhD and you are a, uh, you have a great, great experience in the domain of research, mm -hmm. what would be your advice to the students who are entering the domain of research? Well, I think, you know, when you're thinking about a PhD, probably the most important, I, I, you know, I would have happily gone to Wisconsin. Wisconsin's a good school, right? they have a good school. But the important thing when you're looking to do a PhD is to find an advisor, someone who has, is working in an area that you're interested in. And I always like to find young people, if I can, because they're closer to the lab bench, they're more likely to be able to help you early in your career. Uh, and later on, maybe, you know, you have to rely on others. But if you go to a well-established investigator, make sure he has some postdocs, because it's the postdocs who will provide you most of the learning experience, not your top supervisor. So don't worry so much about the, the top supervisor. And I always suggest it's a good idea not to go and work in a Nobel laureate's lab, uh, because they've already got their Nobel Prize. Go and work for someone who doesn't have it yet, and then maybe you can be a part of theirs. Okay. Thank you, sir. It's been a great okay. Do you believe that understanding the electronic, uh, electronic behavior of the atom of a cancer cell will help us create efficient and accurate treaters of cancer? You, you have to, can you say that again? I, I'm not sure I completely gathered what you were saying. Yes, sir. Do you believe that understanding the behavior of electron is not create efficient and... No, I, I'm still not getting it. What, what is the point that you're trying to make? So, since all kind of matter are made up of, made up of atoms, yeah. cancer cells do made up of atoms. Mm -hmm. So, the, these also, they are also made up of electrons. So, understanding the electronic composition and behavior, we could find, we, sh we should find the accurate and efficient treaters to treat uh, cancer, cancer patients. So, do you believe that understanding the in in restriction enzymes present in the, the cancer cells, sir? I, can somebody explain that to me so that I could take a shot at answering? I, I don't understand what you're saying. I'm sorry. Sir, since all matters are made up of atoms. Sure. Same cancer cells do made up of atoms, so it would contain electrons. So, if we are trying to understand the electronic behavior mm -hmm. of a cancer cell, we are, we it will help us. It would help us to create efficient, and accurate treaters for cancer cells. Yeah, but you have to realize that cancer cells are living cells, right? You know, everything that's living is made up of atoms and so on, and so you know they're going to behave differently depending upon what genes are involved, what genes are turned on, what genes are turned off. So understanding cancer cells at the level you're talking about isn't going to help you to solve cancer. Right? But if you study biology and try to find out how the cancer cells work, then we will be able to find cures. Thank you, sir. So, hello. Uh, yeah, thank you, sir. It was really an enlightening talk. And in 2015, I actually read an article. It was about uh, biology and genetic engineering in general will allow us by 2050 to achieve something like immortality. Immortality is the better term. We would not die by, uh, means uh, we would not die by aging. So this was an article by a Google scientist. So how mm -hmm. far ahead is genetic engineering in this regard? Well, you know, you can't believe everything you read in books, okay? 
There is no such thing as immortality. There never will be. And why would you want to be? You know, what about all these young people? Don't they deserve to have something going for them? Death is a good thing. Death is not a bad thing. You know, when you reach an age where your mind doesn't work as well anymore, your body doesn't work as well, stand aside and let the young people get on with their lives and take over this world. I, I'm not a big fan of over longevity. You, you, you know, live as long as you can if my mind's still working. When my mind goes, I'm happy to die. I have no problems with dying. Okay? It's the natural order of things. Hello, sir. Uh, currently, I am doing uh, engineering in instrumentation and control engineering. Um, though uh, we don't have much knowledge as of now, but we have immense interest in engineering. So please uh, guide us how we can contribute or help in your field as an engin as engineer. Okay. Again, I'm not sure I understood that. Could you say that again, maybe in some different words? Uh, sir, uh, as for now, we don't have much knowledge on engineering, but uh, we have immense interest and uh, later on we might have more knowledge as well. So please guide us how we can use this knowledge and uh, help you uh, in your field as engineers. Okay, so, you know, engineers always make things better. In biology, several things we need better instruments very often in order to do things you know one of the big advances there has been cryo em where you can really study molecule structures get structures out from things that you could never crystallize so and there will be new ways to do that i can't tell you what they're going to be the other way in which i think technology is going to be very very helpful is is in the field of artificial intelligence. And there are many good things that come from that. At the moment, there are a lot of bad things that come out of that. Um, you just look at what happens on social media, thanks to sort of clever AI programs that will only feed you what they think you want to hear and will never give you the other side of the case. But there's lots of things that can be done there to improve that. And, you know, better databases upon which everything works, you know, just looking at what Google is using is not, not the best database. And even looking at the scientific literature is not the best database. A lot of crap in the scientific literature. And so we need to do a better job of just what we're training AI programs on. And we also need to make sure that the AI programs tell us how they reach their conclusions. You know, if you write a scientific paper, you have a section on methods. Okay, those methods tell you how to do things in a way that you can repeat them because they get down into the nitty-gritty details. These AI programs, the generative AI, don't do that, and they should. So there, there's, there are many, many ways, but things are always going to get better. You know? Things are going to get really good. Okay. Sir, thank you for your, for your amazing speech. Sir, I have a small doubt. How close is science to creating life? Like, how can we play God? Can okay. they... So I'm not the person to ask about that, but one of my colleagues, Jack Shostak, who is also a Nobel Prize winner, that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to figure out how life got started and to generate molecules that will emulate um, what he thinks were important when life got started. I'm not sure we're going to create life, and I'm not sure we should be trying to create life. It's bad enough that we uh, are using AI and robots and things in ways that are not completely appropriate. Uh, but, you know, why would you want to create life? Look at what nature has done. Um, I think the life that we have here may be not optimal, but would you want another life to come along and take us all out? I don't think so. So, you know. One of the things I always say, I always encourage people to be scientists. And one of the good things is that scientists disagree all the time. But when we disagree, we don't find it necessary to shoot the other person in order to show that we're right and they're not. This is something that politicians could learn from. 
Uh, thank you, sir, for the wonderful lecture. It was an honor to be here and uh, listen to your uh, entire life story and your achievements. So as an aspiring researcher and knowing there is a long way ahead, my question is, in this fast-paced world, how did you find the confidence to go along the flow of life and being the best in whichever field you love, be it snooker or molecular biology? How did you find the confidence to just go along and doing your best? Well, I, first of all, I, I'm not sure that I'm the best in, in these fields. I'm, I think I'm the luckiest in these fields, but not necessarily the best. I, I'm not a genius. I know so many people who are much smarter than I am. They just haven't had the luck that I had. But I think the important thing is that you should have confidence in yourself and that you should believe that what you're passionate about is really important. And don't let people tell you it's not important. If you find people telling you it's not important, you know, think about it and, and make sure that you're sure that what you're doing is correct. And then you'll be OK. So building self-confidence is very important. And I think this is something that's quite difficult for girls. I have a, a daughter, a very smart daughter, um, one of the things she has a problem with is self-confidence. It's not easy. And I think very often um, families don't treat their daughters as well as they should. They don't give them the confidence that they really need in order to do well in life. And that's often because the mother thinks it's the sons who are important and not the daughter. The daughters have to go and make a family and all of that. But, you know, just believe in yourself and develop self-confidence. Don't let other people tell you you're not as good as they are. That's all I can do. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for the amazing lecture. I really loved it. And uh, I want you touched upon uh, the COVID-19 and how your company helped pr uh, produce enzymes for vaccines. But there was a, like, in many places, there was backlash regarding vaccines that people were like, uh, this is uh, not good and it can cause autism or other uh, sci scientifically not backed up claims that was made against it. So uh, what do you think as an institute we can do to incorporate scientific thinking and uh, instill scientific mentality in people so that they wouldn't, uh, or uh, they wouldn't have these uh, claims like, Right. So I think one of the things that is, for me, a little disappointing is that when scientists are educated, they're often not taught how to talk to the public effectively. We tend to stand up and give talks and use languages and acronyms and words that the general public doesn't understand. And somehow a lot of scientists think this makes you look good. It, it makes you look stupid, in my view. Okay? I like people to stand up, say what they mean, and talk in language that everybody can understand. I, I often give students what I call the grandmother test. Okay? Can you go home, tell your grandmother what you do in the lab every day in language that she can understand? And you test whether you've done a good job as to whether she can then accurately tell all her friends what you do in the lab every day and how smart you are. This is, this is a good thing. You need to learn how to talk to the general public. You know, politicians, one of the reasons they're against science is because they often don't understand. No one's explained it to them in language they can understand. And I, I would advocate making teaching scientists to speak in simple, straightforward language a part of any course in science. It, it's wonderful. And the nice thing about it is if you can do that effectively, when you go to interview for a job, you can use that same technique to talk to the person who wants to hire you. And if they understand everything you say, there's a much better chance they'll give you the job. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Okay. I'm just here waiting for you. Okay. Sir, I have a doubt regarding your experiment. How did you account for any mutations that could have occurred in the virus? Like mutations can occur randomly. Mm -hmm. What if some mutation were to occur? Or did it occur, sir, during your experiment? Well, I mean, because we were basically growing clones, you know, adenovirus, you clone it, 
mutations are not really a problem. It's a small, relatively small molecule. Yes. But usually that's, when you're doing biological experiments, it's not a problem because you've chosen things that, that have not picked up mutations. You know, what mm. often happens when these things pick up mutations, they just don't grow anymore. Yes, so sir, you don't yes. see them. So not something to worry about. In fact, Thank the other sir. piece of advice I would give everybody is do not worry. Worry kills more people than anything I know. And there's no point in worrying. You come across a situation, either you can do something about it, then do it, or you can't. And if you can't, don't worry. Worry is, is not a good thing. I, I don't worry about anything. I, I, I'm a very happy, very content person. If I see something needs doing, I try to do it. If I can't do anything about it, I don't worry. I'll think about that. Okay, so that concludes the Q&A session. That was a very enlightening and insightful session, sir. We are grateful for the knowledge you bestowed upon us. Now, we request the CFGL heads, Ashwat, Preetika, and Sagnik to come on stage and present the handmade Tanger painting to Dr. Roberts. Thank you, sir, for your time. We wish you all the very best on your future endeavors and contributions to society. You're truly one of the greatest minds of our time and an inspiration to many people all over the world. We would once again like to thank our sponsors for making Pregyan 24, title sponsored by Larson & Tubron, co-powered by Cisco, driven by TVS Apache, we thank Bharat Varsity, our youth partner, Technosport, our associate partner, NLC, our energy partner, and Recal, our alumni association, Harley Davidson, our motorcycle partner, Titan I Plus, our principal infotainment partner, Zebronix, our audio partner, and Unibic, our snack partner. We thank Recal, our alumni association, for making this event the 1980 Batch Chair Fund. Nobel Laureate Guest Lecture possible. Thank you. And we have another announcement. Get ready to grow and grow at PG Naidu's open mic. Whatever you are a seasoned performer or just looking to soak in the vibes, this is the place to be. See you at PG Naidu's open mic. Keep your eyes open for exciting goodies and refreshments in the evening at around 4 p.m. Thank you all.